on for United Nations climate change talks. So he, it is here. This is a pre-discussion before COP 20, 29. Uh, so I am here with uh, Isabella Kozel, right? So you you are heading uh, that one organization based in Kathmandu, and you cover eight Asian countries. So can you explain your organization first? Yes. Then we can discuss further. I will focus um, primarily on knowledge. Um, and we, we are an intergovernmental organization and we, we focus on knowledge, largely ensuring that we build and share knowledge to get that into policy, into practice and investment. And our overall vision is to build a greener, more inclusive and climate resilient Hindu Kush Himalaya. We have about 200 people um, from all our eight countries and we focus on managing climate and environment risks, restoring and regenerating mountain livelihoods and landscapes, um, working to enhance regional collaboration but also being present at fora such as these to ensure that the world is aware of the very difficult situation facing the Hindu Kush Himalaya because of climate change. The talks are important because they bring all the parties together and obviously there are many parties and so it can take time to reach consensus but the global consensus is important. Um, however, um, yes, it takes a long time to, to get that global consensus but over the last 10, 20 years there has been some progress. Many would argue it's too slow, but nonetheless the global consensus is important. However, that shouldn't detract us from working at national level and at local level to put new approaches, new practices in policy, in projects on the ground and supporting communities to deal with the impacts that are already hitting many communities in the mountains. So we shouldn't just leave it to the global right. negotiations. The global negotiations create the enabling framework. We also need to start working on the ground. And so our institution, we work at local, national, regional and, and global levels for that reason. You uh, deal with the people who are struggling with the basic amenities. They don't have that kind of that climate change is the second priority for them. You know, once they have the livelihood, once they have their you know basic needs to be fulfilled. In that situation, how difficult it is for you to convince them? Well, for communities who are still relying on agriculture, right. um, that they, they care about climate change because they're 100 percent dependent on the weather right. and on natural resources, whether it's the irrigation water in the spring from the snow. So if snow falls late and doesn't thaw, then the irrigation waters aren't coming at a critical time in spring. So actually, communities living in the mountains are very aware of climate change and how that's impacting them. So they want to act, they want to change. The challenge is, is that they're on the front line of these impacts and right. yet they have not contributed to global warming. Mm -hmm. Um, because they're amongst the lowest income yeah. communities in the world. So they are powerless to do much about the root cause mm -hmm. of all these changes. And that is why it's so important to be present and to, to raise their voices internationally because the action has to happen outside of the mountains. I think the, uh, the, the bigger challenge comes when it, it, it relates to national policy, national procedures, investments, of course, um, adjusting investment to be greener and more climate resilient costs more because mm -hmm. the enabling policy environment isn't there, the economic incentives aren't there, so that does create huge dilemmas for, for governments and for investors. So what we're trying to do in a very, very small way is to look at at least if you're putting in an investment in a mountain area, what might be the climate risks that will affect right. it. But this is really where, where the global community needs to be far more cognizant of these additional costs 
um, and there is climate finance and there is substantial climate finance but we're not getting it to the right places fast enough and and so how could we more effectively leverage that climate finance to cover some of these extra costs of building a a more robust bridge oh, yeah. or constructing your house um, in a more expensive area because it's less pr flood prone. Mm -hmm. So these are, are all costly exercises and we need to find a way of bringing in the finance to cover those additional costs. And whilst the, in principle it's there, it's not getting to those who need it. Where all those stakeholders are meeting and discussing their points. We are also apprehensive about how the outcome will be and they only just think and they tell that why we should take burden of the Western mistakes that uh, we are suffering and why we should follow if we are not getting the funded or supported uh, when we need demand. So how you see that African people are at the same page that what the Asian you see that being here in Kathmandu? I mean, unfortunately, if we don't start taking all these considerations into our policy planning, investments, budgets, um, we're, we're really up against the brick wall. So uh, wise budgeting and planning, now it has to incorporate these elements. Um, and yes, it, it does generate additional costs, not always, um, not always. Um, and sometimes you can create interventions that appear costly, but actually, they're pretty cost effective in the medium term, um, maybe not so much in the short term. But the cost of inaction is going to be far higher. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, take a very simple issue, which isn't really climate related, which is plastics. You know, the cost of managing those plastics is huge, mm -hmm. but currently we're not, we're not dealing with it. Right. Um, and the costs are long term in terms of microplastics and health. It's the same with air pollution. In the short term, the additional cost of mitigation is very high, but the long term cost of huge health um, implications for large populations is going to be huge. So, uh, you are dealing with the country, one is very critical country, Afghanistan. You know that you that is also your jurisdiction of those working area. So at the moment, the situation is of course challenging. Um, so Afghanistan remains on our board, um, but the engagement has been substantially reduced. I think at the moment they have many many other issues to, to tackle. Um, we do have technical um, people who do join some of our online meetings to learn and understand about some of the issues which we hope they take back to their own administrations and, and un to un better understand how mm -hmm. to deal with quite severe climate impacts that are happening in Afghanistan. I think there's been a prolonged drought now yeah. there for quite some time. Um, but we, at the moment, it's not easy for us um, to, to work on, on the ground. Coming to the end you know, of the discussion, I wanted to know, you have been participating in lots of discussion here. How much hope you have again that it will take to the COP29 for the, you, that your suggestion will be taken or considered in a, in a long way? So we're in a, an expert dialogue on mountains today which has brought together quite a large number of, of parties. Mm -hmm. We're hoping we'll raise the profile of mountains um, in all the negotiating tracks. Again, it's a step-by-step -step process, process um, but we do sincerely hope that mountains will now be recognized and addressed not only for the value that they offer but the risks associated with the extreme changes that are happening in mountains which of course for the Hindu Kush Himalaya when that ice melts it has massive global implications mm -hmm. um, so it's in the interest of the entire conference of the parties to address these issues in all the negotiating tracks, including mitigation, including finance, as well as adaptation. So we hope this expert dialogue will focus um, the, the asks as we move into 
the preparations for COP29. Yeah, how much hope you have from India? So, of course, all the measures taken by the Indian government are extremely important for us. We, in, the Indian government sits on our board. Um, of course, um, I know, we're very aware that, that the, the, the line agencies are very familiar with some of the risks facing the mountains. We were recently um, in Delhi talking to the Department of Land and Resources about their efforts around watershed management and how we can bring spring shed management into mm -hmm. those huge mm -hmm. programs. And uh, there's a lot of interest and in, to, to factor in springs. Springs, of course, are the lifeline for right. most mountain communities, even though they're not always so, they don't yeah. feel that important, but actually they're they're critically do. important mm -hmm. for mountain communities. Um, so, so there's quite a significant effort moving forwards there. I mean, obviously, um, every country needs to work towards decarbonisation, um, but of course it's the richer countries that, that also need to do that. Um, as well as the, the, the middle-income countries and the lower-income countries. Thank you so much for your time and talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So this was a talk uh, with the expert from the Himalayan the Hindu Kush region and in India. They are working on the nature and conservation of the uh, things which is happening due to climate change. And they are very much hopeful about this bond talk also from the COP29 to be taken, their suggestion to be considered.